it's using a, it's not really a strategy, is it? People use it as a strategy, but it's an acquisition method, really, called a purchase lease option. We were going into tier two, tier three, and so ha having viewings for the next lot of tenants was tricky. And so my goal was always to replace my income. Um, which I did in about 18 months because I was using this mixed strategy approach. This is Ant Lyons from Your Property Network magazine and uh, you're probably watching this on our YouTube channel or on Facebook and like in many of our videos uh, we're talking to real life property investor about a real life property deal and this um, particular project we talk about today is, is one of my favorites because it involves a huge element of creativity and finding a win-win deal with the, with the owner. Um, so I'm really, really pleased to be talking to Kim Opshower today. So Kim, you were in a Hi, hello, welcome to hello, the Hello, hi, thanks for having me. Uh, welcome. Um, and you were in a recent uh, edition of YPM where you talked about this project and, and quite a number of others because you kind of specialise in these creative deals, don't you? Finding a, a win-win and legally yeah. structuring it because you're, perhaps you can tell us a bit about your background and, and how that's helped find a, a creative way to do a deal. Yes, yeah, so, so I'm a corporate commercial solicitor I've uh, been practicing for almost 10 years now. So I'm very familiar with commercial contracts and joint ventures, deal structuring um, from the legal side. So um, yeah, I, I'm not afraid to sort of try and do things a little bit different. Um, and it's just finding the right solicitor to make sure that the right legal paperwork's put in place. Okay, brilliant. And the, the project we're going to talk about in a minute is it's using a, it's not really a strategy, is it? People use it as a strategy, but it's an acquisition method, really, called a purchase lease option, which some people viewing this might have heard of. Other people will have absolutely no idea what it means. Correct me as I try and explain it, please <laughs> correct me. So what we're talking about is a way of controlling a property over a period of time deriving a revenue from it so generating a rental profit from it even when we don't own it and um, exercising that option to buy it at a point in the future for an agreed price so um have i put that six yes that make, okay yeah absolutely i think the only thing that, that sometimes people don't understand is that it is an option so it's not uh, from a seller perspective you're not guaranteeing that you're going to buy the property at the end it, it's you it's up to you if you want to exercise that option and I always think that's something that needs to be made clear from the start with the seller yeah okay so it's the op the option not the obligation to buy so exactly. from our from, from our point of view as the investor it's it's really flexible you know we can decide to to exercise that option and purchase the property at a later date or not depending on the circumstances at the time. So, yeah. um, so tell us about this property. What, what was it and how did you find it? Yeah, so this was uh, an existing six bedroom HMO. At the time it had, it, so three rooms were taken and three were empty. So the vendor was struggling with um, to let the rooms. We approached him via direct vendor marketing. So we sort of started doing that as soon as we decided that HMOs was going to be our strategy. And I say, um, my husband and I, we, we have our investment company together. So we, we sent direct to vendor marketing and he caught, was quite an early response. Um, he was actually living abroad um, and the, the property was a problem for him. He, he was struggling with voids. He'd kind of heard about HMOs, bought a property in an article four area turned it into a HMO and thought he's just going to get loads of cash flow and and you know he could move to move abroad and just live off the profits and the reality was um the property was quite tired it needed it needed to be modernized obviously with HMOs there's all the safety regulations licensing compliance and it just wasn't what he he kind of expected so when he picked this up is, this is fairly common isn't it you know mm. that people get into it and then over the years perhaps enthusiasm wanes the property gets tired and then we end up with an HMO which on paper should be great you know the six bedrooms sort of chunking away a nice profit but the reality is 
probably got some problem tenants in there um and it's not very appealing to to other people so those no. are killing it so i would imagine this property was probably costing him money each month yes yeah it was absolutely so he he was very fed up at the point that he picked up the phone to us but it wasn't it wasn't a quick deal and I do find that with creative strategies um when you start talking about other ways of finding a solution it does take that little bit longer so when he first approached us we we thought we'd do an, a rent to rent deal so we just guaranteed a rent for a number of years but the rent that he wanted, needed, was a lot higher than we, we were willing to give at that point. Um, the profit just wasn't worth it. We need to spend money on the property. Um, and so there was a gap. There was a gap between what he, he wanted and what we were willing to give. So And what financially it, you can afford to pay and still make a profit y- yourself. Exactly, so. exactly. So we just followed up. Um, we actually got, I got really friendly with the, the seller. We'd call, we'd speak at least once a month, sort of see how he's getting on, how his voids were, were going. And it, you know, the position didn't change. I think actually one person moved out. So he was, he then had four rooms empty. So, um, he was getting more and more in a position where he wanted a solution. Um, and in, in during one of these conversations, he just happened to mention that he actually wanted to sell the property. It wasn't, HMOs weren't what he was expecting and if he could sell he he would prefer to sell but he would have paid a high early repayment charge he was in a long-term fixed mortgage and he still has several years left so as soon as he mentioned that my sort of mind started worrying and thinking actually a lease option could be perfect because we'd be willing to pay more each month on the basis that we were we're going to be buying the property um, and the seller would have that certainty of um, sale at the end. So it worked really well for, for both of us. Okay. And so you said you were willing to pay more. And in this case, that's because part of the um, sort of monthly payment that you were making towards them was actually going towards the deposit that, uh, for when you choose to buy the property. At yeah. The end. That's right, isn't it? So. Yes. Yeah. So the, the the monthly payment that we make is £1,400 a month and £700 of that is his mortgage. Um, and we agreed that, and it's a capital repayment mortgage, I should say that. So he, we agreed that that capital that we were repaying, the £700 would be deducted from the purchase price when we when we purchase it. So um, if we purchase in th- after three years, so three years into the option is when we can exercise it. We've got between three and five years to exercise um but let's say for example purposes we we did it at three years we would have made around twenty five thousand pounds worth of payments um if you accumulate the 700 pounds a month so the purchase price would be reduced by by that amount okay now it's really important when we're agreeing those types of deals in particular are paying towards the deposit that is done legally in the correct way. And no one could be more aware of that than you, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, and it's definitely a pitfall that I think some people, a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing because it could be very easy not to get that in the right format, I would imagine. I wanted to talk to you about the um, the kind of vision for the property as well, because you paint a picture of it as being sort of, and I think we could all imagine it, we're going to see some pictures now and, you know, bit tired, you know, bit unloved, probably not that appealing to anyone moving in. So you wanted to turn that around and aim it at a very different market as well. So who were your, who were your end tenants going to be? Yeah, so this one was a funny one, actually, because he, I think for years, he'd had it as a student property, but because he was struggling to let it, had started letting it to professionals so at the time that we took it on there were a mixture of tenant types which we all know doesn't doesn't work so we we already had experience in professional HMO so we set it up as a professional um, HMO and then last year we um, got our first student HMO just around the corner from this property and it performed really well um, we liked the student model and with COVID and everything else we realized we didn't want all our eggs in the the professional tenant sort of basket so we decided to switch that to students so we we've switched that now so it's now students but it was um professionals for two years 
Yeah. Okay. And um, the student market really does have some advantage in terms of the management side of things over and above some of the other HMO strategies, if that's what we're going to call them, because all of our normally, I guess, they're marketed around about sort of December time, November, December, January exactly. for students to sort of move in at the end of the summer for the start of the academic year. And, and you know that they're moving in as one group. They're going to be in there for the year and you've got a certainty of, of the length of tenancy and you can diarise the sort of maintenance side of things as well. So they're, they're really, yeah. appealing. they can be really appealing. Student market changes all the time as we, we know. And um, how have you found that? How have you found uh, your sort of first student lets? Yeah, I mean, we we did it during COVID. So we've had, uh, <laughs> we've probably started at the worst time, but for us, I suppose it only gets better from here. We, as you say you market the properties towards the end of the year and I, I don't know if you remember last year but at the time we were going into tier two tier three and so ha having viewings for the next lot of tenants was tricky you know we had to have all sorts of measures in place um only a couple of potential tenants from the group were allowed to visit we had to sort of make arrangements for our tenants not yeah. to be there so um, and there was a great deal of uncertainty at the time as well about whether or not anyone's going to be actually studying at yes. university or, or from home or on you know in, in the room studying so uh, definitely a baptism of fire I think for yes. you there. yeah and I think um we we were always conscious of that when we when we took on the first the first property which was on a rent to rent basis um but we've we've had international students students studying vocational courses so we haven't found it's the same as your traditional sort of English history you know kind of degrees they're studying things like doctors they're nursing midwifery they're they're always going to be needed they're not going to, and they can't be done online yeah. you know there's only so much that you can you can teach online in those sorts of courses and obviously with international students, they, they come for the year. They don't have that option of going home for the Christmas holidays or, well, in, in our case, there haven't been. So, um, but that wasn't a conscious decision by us. It just happened to be that, in fact, all of our properties have that tenant type. So um, we were kind of protected in that respect because I know that some student landlords did have um, difficulties with students saying, I'm online, I'm going home and I don't want to pay my rent for the rest of the year. I, I think um, there were some definite challenges and, you know, we can understand both sides of that yeah. without a doubt. So, so financially, what does this property do for you? So you've added this one into the, um, into the portfolio. How much money did you need to spend on it? What did you have to do and, and what does it do for you now towards that sort of goal of, um, I, I don't really like the term, but sort of financial freedom with the point where work becomes optional, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, so, so tell us about that. So we didn't actually spend a huge amount on the property. I think it was around £3,000. We did a lot of the work ourselves. So this was back at the start when, you know, money was tight and we were trying to, to do everything ourselves. So we did save um, on costs in that respect. We did have legal fees. So we had £1,000 of, of legal fees. Um, it's something that's very important with lease options and any creative kind of deals is to make sure that you have a solicitor that understands that whatever it is you're trying to do and also that the seller solicitor does as well so we incurred legal costs and we also had to apply for planning permission which we paid for um the seller did not know about article four um so he just set up the the property and obtained the license um but didn't have planning permission so we had to apply for that so there were a few thousand pounds worth of costs up front um and so we ran it as a professional let for a couple of years and we were probably taking around eight, eight, nine hundred pounds profit a month. Um, but that's increased significantly now that we've sort of done up the property again, we've freshened it up and let it to students. So our running costs have gone down and, and now we're making around fourteen hundred a month um, profit. Uh, I mean, tax. it really is amazing. It's, it's very much the kind of deal I love talking to people about because it's creative. And for most people outside of our community, they would struggle to see that it would be possible to make sort of £1,400 a month from a property that you, you don't own. Um, yeah. And it's only really, you know, it's why I love what we do with the magazine so much because we can talk through those projects and show that 
really anything is possible if you've got the kind of will and the determination to do it. So, um, so yeah, where, where are you now in your kind of um, property sort of journey? Are you Did you reach that sort of financial freedom bit? And, and what's next for you as well? Yeah, so I did meet, my, my financial target was just to replace my income. Um, working as a corporate lawyer, um, before property, I was working at very large international law firms. So you can imagine the hours I was working, seven days a week, you know, sometimes 100 hour weeks. And so my goal was always to replace my income, um, which I did in about 18 months because I was using this mixed strategy approach. Um, so I was doing buy, refurbish, refinance, rent to rents, lease options. And so by doing a mixture, the pot of cash that I had meant that I could actually obtain um, a lot more cash flowing properties. Um, and so now we're kind of focusing on the same. Um, we've just acquired two more HMOs, which are going to be student. And um, so we're doing those at the moment. We're in the middle of refurbishment and hoping to have, well, one has been let, uh, refurbishment's finished and is let for the next two years, actually. There's the tenants that took it signed for two years for the rest of their degree. Um, and then the other one is in refurbishment and it's almost almost let. So fingers crossed for that one. And it will be finished just before the students return in September. Okay, fantastic. So proper deadline there of, of when you need to be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the builders are loving me at the moment with my <laughs> constant updates needed. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. I know um, with the full article in the magazine, we go into a lot more detail about those different types of projects and how you got started and some of the obstacles along the way because it's it's very easy to talk about these things and they sound plain sailing but the truth is there's there's hiccups and speed bumps along the way without a doubt so <laughs> um so if anybody's watching this maybe a good place to to, to stop next is over at our website yourpropertynetwork.co.uk um the magazine is absolutely full of real life investors, ordinary people achieving extraordinary things in property, detailing their case studies, um, their life changing deals, actually, each deal which gets you sort of closer to that goal, whatever that might be. Um, it's absolutely packed full of all these kind of real life case studies and my finance broker writes in there, my planning consultant writes in there, all, all those experts as well. So you get your first copy completely free of charge um, and access to the YPN app if you take out a trial subscription. So just go to yourpropertynetwork.co.uk to find out a little bit more about us. Um, we've got loads of case studies and uh, videos on the website as well. So Kim, it's been a complete pleasure talking to you today. I wish you best of luck with um, the, the next steps in your journey and hopefully Thank we can- you reconnect again and um, yes. look at some more of your amazing deals yeah great thank you Anne